is good to be back with you tonight um, as we worship our God together. Uh, this morning I was in Trustful uh, speaking there at the congregation there. And the way they do services is they have two, basically two services in the morning. So I preached two sermons this morning and now this one tonight. So that makes a total of three sermons in one day, which is an all new time record for me. And I ask that you congratulate me after this sermon. And next year we're going to shoot for four. So we always have high hopes for how many sermons Andrew can preach in one day. But regardless of all that, uh, I'm so happy to be back. Uh, There's a comfort in speaking to people from home. Uh, And I'm so excited that I get to present this sermon, have this opportunity to do this tonight. And what we're going to talk about is a very simple concept, uh, something that we talk about often when we study books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. We're just going to be talking about a good name. Uh, What is a good name? Name, what is your reputation? And we see all through the Bible how important having a good name really is. It's not something to be taken very lightly at all. And what's different than those of the Bible who had their names, uh, our names don't mean anything by the name itself anymore. Uh, We don't have anyone that introduces themselves as says, my name is Peter, which means stone or rock. And no one will go up to you and say, my name is Barnabas, son of encouragement. Uh, That's not the way we get our meanings from our names anymore. If anyone came up to you and actually told you what their name meant, if you go back to the Greek, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Uh, I like to tell people my name is Andrew, which means manly warrior. I really enjoy that that is the meaning of the Greek word Andrew. But that really has no meaning anymore. No one names names their children those names because of what it means. It's just if it sounds pretty or not, or if it's with the style of the day. Now, we do name names based on things that are going on in the world. And we try to avoid names, especially names that are bad. You don't know a lot of kids named Adolf, do you? Uh, We don't name our kids Adolf because of the terrible person he was, and we don't want people to go up to that person and say, my name's Adolf, and the first reaction, the first impression is going to be, well, Hitler. That's not what you want. Uh, My granddad's name is Fritz McCready. But being born right after World War II and Fritz being such a German name, he started going... Uh, by the name Mac, because it's the first three letters of his last name, McCready. So he basically changed his name, called, told people his name was Mac, so he wouldn't have to deal with people making fun of him for calling him Fritz. Uh, and even my name, uh, Andrew Smith. Uh, if you look at people named Andrew born in 1992, they all stopped being called Andrew in August of 92. I'm one of the last Andrews of that generation. And that's because Hurricane Andrew hit in August 1992. I was born in May 1992. And just like there's not a lot of kids named Andrew after August 92, there's not a lot of kids named Katrina. There's not a lot of kids named Ivan. Because of all these terrible things that are associated with that name. Now what your name does mean is basically your actions. And that's what we're really going to talk about. And what we all hope for is we have such a name that you can introduce yourself and say, hey, my name's Andrew Smith, and this person knows who you are, we hope they go, okay, you're Andrew Smith, and not go, oh, he's Andrew Smith, which is all based on your reputation. So what we're going to do is, is we're just going to first look at some quick facts of what the Bible says about our names, what it, what it says about our reputations, how much they mean, and then we're going to actually look at the Apostle Paul when he has to defend his own name in the book of 2 Corinthians here at the end. Uh, So this is what we're going to look at. I want to ask ourselves, uh, to ask ourselves this honestly as we go into this, is what does your name mean to others? When you do introduce yourself to people that do know you or do know of you, what is the first thing they think of? And being that you tell it to yourself in your mind, you don't have to say it out loud, you can be honest with yourself. And hopefully these are some things that can help us either build up our good names or maintain them. Some quick facts on good names. This is the way we're going to start. We know from the Bible that they are extremely, extremely valuable. Proverbs 22, first two verses, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor, rather than silver or gold. Ecclesiastes 7, a good name is better than precious ointment. That a good name or loving favor, all these things are so much more than these material things. And I think it's very interesting that when the Bible talks about our reputation, about our good names, it compares them to material things. After all, our names 
of what they are on this earth are an earthly thing, aren't they? Uh, to a degree, Andrew, that is an earthly thing, name. I was given to it by my earthly parents. That's what it is. And a good name on top of that will help you achieve these riches. I think that's one of the reasons why it's better than that. The way in this economy, in this marketplace, how do you get a job today? Well, you see a whole bunch of names on a list, and if that employer can recognize one of those names, that's one of the ways you're going to get an interview. It's if they know your name, and it's almost like you have to know someone on the inside that can endorse you and say, this is a name that you should remember. And even on top of that, let's say you've already been hired, what do you have to do? You have to work hard and do things so that your name means something. Okay, I see this name, I recognize this name, and these are all the things that I know that this person has done by that name. And that's the way you get promoted. All these riches and treasures most of the time come from just having a good name. Now, of course, I don't hope our main motive in this is to receive material blessings. But if you have a good name, you will do decent in this life. So there's a lot of material blessings that come with something that God teaches us to do. Uh, as well as this, if you look at Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, uh, being perhaps maybe Solomon is the writer of Ecclesiastes, did Solomon have a good name? He did. He had a very famous name. If you look at 1 Kings 10, we see the Queen of Sheba knowing him. It says he knows of his fame and knows his, of his relationship with the Lord and w- wishes to come to him. And it says, ask him hard questions which Solomon's going to answer. And we see from the biblical point of view and a historical point of view, Solomon had a great name. He was known for his wisdom. He was known for his treasures. He was known for his fame. And most importantly, I love that phrase in 1 Kings 10, he was known for his relationship with God. That is what people thought of when they thought of the name Solomon. And I hope we can all achieve to the point where we can get that type of name like a name like Solomon. And being that Solomon had this great name, he did a whole lot for the nation of Israel, bringing the nation of Israel to its, basically its peak uh, as as a nation. Uh, They had more wealth, they had more of everything when Solomon was king, and I think this has a lot to do with the things that were attributed to his name. Uh, Also, another thing to think about is that when we read the Bible, we see that our names actually do matter to other people. It actually does matter what other people think, and I put this little side, to a degree. Now, when we grow up as children, something our parents tell us when we go to school, we have to deal with bullies and all these people that are just cruel, we tell them, look, it doesn't matter what other people think. You do what you need to do, and that's that. And I say that's a true statement. That's something we do need to tell our kids. I think we have a lot of instances of Paul telling that to Timothy. Look, people are cruel. People want to fight. People are going to pick fights with you. You need to give them one chance, and if they just see that they just want to be cruel, you don't need to worry about them. That is a biblical point of view. The problem is, is when we take that perspective, that idea, and we apply it to the way that we act. And we say, well, I can do this, I can do that. I can live in adultery, I can fornicate, I can be sexually immoral, I can be a liar, I can speak with evil language. But you know what, it doesn't matter what other people think. 1 Peter 2.12, Beloved, I beg of you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, then that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Obviously, again, we can only hope that people would think so much about us and only of what is in our control. Whether you're an evildoer or or a righteous Christian, that's your choice. That's something that you have the control over. No one's forcing you to sin. But you go and do what Peter's saying. You say all a part of these fleshly lusts that war against your soul. You're all a part of that. That's what your conduct describes. The Gentiles, those that are outside of Christ, are going to see you, and they're going to think of you as an evildoer. And they have every right to. Because in that situation that we just described, you are an evildoer. However... If you do care what other people think in this perspective and you let your conduct be righteous, conduct that Christ would represent, then what are they going to do? They're going to glorify God. And even when they come to a situation when they may accuse you of being an evildoer, they will remember your conduct, they will remember what truthfully your name represents, and they will glorify God. So our good names are not just valuable, but they're a way that we can cause others to glorify God. 
what makes us even worth more. And even more so, we want to protect that good name uh, so that everyone can see us. And hopefully when they will ask why, why is your conduct like this, you can't point them towards God. I act this way. Uh, my reputation is this way because I try to imitate my father. And that would be a great way for someone to even begin uh, the, a life with Christ. Uh, one more quick fact. A Christian's name must be worthy of the gospel. And this is the highest standard that we have as we talk about good names. It is higher than treasures. It is higher than precious ointment. It is higher than anything on this earth. It is supposed to be as high as the name of Jesus. Philippians 1.27, Paul here actually not talking to the individual, but talking to the church at Philippi. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. That when he hears the name, the Church of Christ of Philippi, this church at Philippi, when he hears their name, what does he think of? What is Paul's first reaction? Well, these are people that stand fast in one spirit. They're of one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. These people hold a name that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Of having our names, and even though our names are so important, the most important name that we all carry as Christians is Christ. You carry his name with you. And every time you let someone know that you're a Christian, every time you put on your Facebook profile that you're a Christian under religious views, everything you do, everything that people see attributed to your name is now related back to Christ. Everything. And hopefully soon, this is something I've been wanting to do, and I'm going to push it back a couple of Sundays, but I'm actually trying uh, to get something together about how we approach our Islamic friends. I'm finding more and more, especially with the school I'm going to and some research I've done, that Islam is actually growing in the state of Alabama. It's actually becoming one of our main religions in the state of Alabama. And that's really weird to think about, but as far as I can tell, it's true. And the few opportunities I've had to speak with someone who is Islamic, what are the first things I have to deal with? The first things I have to always deal with is all these people throughout the years that have been carrying the name Christian and all the evil things they have done. The Spanish Inquisition was evil. They went out and they killed people because they weren't part of the Catholic Church. That is evil. Yet they claimed to be Christians. The Crusades. The majority of all that the Crusades was done just stealing land from people. They were evil. And guess what? They claimed to be Christians. And we can go through all these different evil people in this world that claimed to be Christians. And it has been nothing but harm the name of Christ. So being that we are not going to be evil people because we are true Christians, there are two things we need to think of. Number one, we're special because we have the name of Christ. And that does make us more worthy and more precious than those ointments or those treasures. That does make us special. But number two, that we carry the name of Christ, that is a huge responsibility. We all have to live in such a way when they see our name and they know that we also carry the name of Christ, that our conduct is in such a way that is in fact righteous, blameless. It's a huge responsibility. And it's something that every day when people see us on the street, we have to constantly be thinking about. That we do represent, our reputation does in fact represent Jesus Christ. And what a great thing to have to live up to, to actually be worthy of, of the gospel, and we'll come back to some of these thoughts in just a second. One of the great things about living uh, in the United States, I believe, or maybe just in this society, is that our last names don't mean as much as they've used to or they do in other nations. Uh, we have no caste system or no family grouping system that, okay, well, this is your last name, so this is where you belong, this is your last name, so this is where you belong. Most of all, when we're born in this country, we have a blank slate. Uh, do we not? No. My name's Andrew Smith, and I can make that whatever I want Andrew Smith to me. Now, that's all going to be done by my conduct. And being that we have a neutral state, or maybe even some of us are born with a positive name, there are ways that we can lose it. And we can lose it so fast. So I believe that the most of all, 
what we have to struggle to do as we carry the name, our own name, in the name of Christ, is to protect this name. And these are two ways that I believe that people can take away our good names. This first one is very obvious. Not walking worthy of the gospel, what we just talked about. And bringing back First Peter, those that do not abstain from the lust of the flesh. If you are a sinner, guess what your reputation is going to be? You're going to be a sinner. That's just the way it is. If you're an adulterer, people are going to have a reputation of knowing you as an adulterer. If you are a liar, you're going to have a reputation of those who say, oh, well, that person is a liar. That's just the way it's going to be. And especially going back to our social networking and our internet and all that stuff, there is no way you can hide from people anymore. There is no way you can hide from people. And people get so upset when their reputations have just gone uh, to a pit. And one of the first things you have to ask is, well, why is that? It's because it is that way, isn't it? Your reputation is in a pit because you are in a pit. And what we do is, is when we fall under this category sometimes... And we do all these sinful things and we live as a sinner. We have a reputation as a sinner. Instead of just repenting and asking, looking to Jesus for forgiveness, instead of doing that, we start blaming all those that speak evil about our name. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Gossip is a sin. Speaking evil about others is a sin. But the problem is, is when you're living in a sinful state and you're so worried about all these other people talking bad about your name... You you have no right to go tell them to repent. It goes back to the basic principle that Jesus taught us. Take the plank out of your own eye before you start taking the speck out of theirs. If you're in that situation where people are talking evil about your reputation because, in fact, you are evil, first you need to repent yourself, get out of that evil, and then you have a way, and you should, I believe, to go talk to these people about that. Okay, I was doing evil, I did repent, I need you to help me build up my name back. That's the way that this should be approached. So don't ever be evil and think you have a right to a good name. It just does not work that way. If we can get that out and clear, then we can move on to these next couple of points. And these next couple of points that we're going to make, I'm going to be talking about someone that in fact is not evil, yet people still attack their good name. Gossip and corrupt words. People just attack because they want to attack. Ephesians 4, let's turn over there. Actually start reading some out of our Bibles here. Just one short sentence here, but it makes my point. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. As we speak, we're supposed to edify, we're supposed to impart grace. What I would say when I study the words edify and impart grace and grace, I'm saying is, I think what Paul's saying is, do not say anything unless it can bring someone closer to God. That is the reason why we speak. Now, some would try to take this back to our first point, well, rebuking would not fit in this category. But I would say that rebuking, if you're doing it in the correct manner, doing it the way that Jesus has taught us to do, trying to tell someone to repent, that is trying to bring someone closer back to God. That is imparting grace. So I don't believe that's what he's talking about here. I think he's talking about here just people that want to be corrupt and they just want to dig a pit under you. And as a Christian, as Christians, I believe we probably all have faced this scenario that people just don't like you. And they just speak evil about you. And they just terrorize what your name means. And they might even go as far to terrorize what the name Christ means. Well, how do we handle that situation? Well, lucky for us, this is exactly the situation that Paul was in. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, and we'll be staying there for the rest of the night. In the Corinthian letter... We believe by reading the second Corinthian letter that was probably more than just two letters. There was probably at least three and maybe even perhaps four. But all I want you to remember is there was probably, well, not probably, most definitely a letter in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians where Paul had written to them 
about their situation, and they rejected that letter. They didn't take it the way that they should have taken it. And what happens is, is all these people develop uh, in Corinth that are just talking trash about Paul, basically. Mainly saying that he really isn't an apostle. And they would say, look at his face. Look at about him. Look how weak he is. He can barely stand. He can barely talk. He has all these scars all over him. There's no way that he's an apostle of Jesus. And all these different things that they were trying to terrorize, terrorize what it means to be Paul, what they were doing is trying to bring the, the authority that Paul had upon themselves. Well, we're what he calls the imminent apostles, the super apostles. We are so much better than he is. You need to basically listen to us. So in 2 Corinthians, he's had a good report, and now he's ready to write to them about that whole situation. He knows, Paul knows, that he has to maintain and build up back his good name, even though they never should have taken his name in the first place. What's used all through this letter uh, is the word boast. In the high school class, the past couple of weeks, what we've been doing is going through the book of James. And what we did together is we would underline repeated words in James. And what's great about the inspired writers is when they repeat themselves or repeat a noun or a verb, that is a wasp. They just got about this close to me. I didn't know if I should swat it or just, just calm down. Talk about distractions. That'll get you. In 2 Corinthians, the noun or verbs, if you would go through this and underline the most of, would be the word boast. Almost in every chapter, he says the word boast. And let's look at an example of this, kind of near the end of the book, in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 16, I say again, let no one think of me a fool, if otherwise at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I will also boast. For you put up with these fools gladly, since yourselves are wives. You put up with these men that are tearing down my name, they're fools but you're supposed to be wise, so now I'm going to boast a little. And basically what he's going to do is tell the Corinthian brethren about himself, about who he really is. Now, looking at the word boast, the way that Paul uses boast is not the same way that we use it today. Uh, If anyone says they were boasting, what we usually mean is in a negative sense, right? Well, they were boasting. They were talking good about themselves for no purpose. This person is so boastful. That isn't a person we want to be. Now, however, we use the word pride sometimes in a positive way. And what I'm trying to describe here is we've switched the meanings of the words that we use today from the biblical use of the word. Pride in the Bible is always in a negative sense. Always. Pride is always a sin. You do not want to be prideful. Yet today in our language, we do use the word pride in a positive way sometimes. Someone's uh, walking all over the things you're doing at your work, at your job, in your school. You say, hey, look, you need to take some pride in the work that you do. Someone's walking all over your good name and you're not doing anything about it. You're not telling them that they're wrong. We say you need to take some pride in who you are. And we use it in a positive way. Hey, this is your true self. You need to be true to your true self. Well, the way that we use the word pride is the way that Paul's using the word boast. I need to boast just a little so you know who my true self is, what my name truly represents. So he boasts a little so they know the truth of the matter. And this is all for a purpose. And don't get me wrong, he doesn't just tell them about all the things he can do and all the things he is for no reason. There is a reason. And the reason is that they took away his good name. They compelled him. If we just look over in chapter 12, Lost the chapter there. Chapter 12, again, verse 11. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you. For in nothing was I behind the most imminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches? except that I myself was not burdensome to you. Forgive me of this wrong. He's saying the reason why I'm having to boast and the reason why he is boasting basically through this entire book is because they compelled him to. 
Paul saw his good name being diminished. And Paul's good name being diminished as an apostle and being who Paul is would do so much harm to these people. He was their representation of who Jesus was. He tells these people in 1 Corinthians, imitate me for I imitate Christ. There's a purpose behind his boasting. And so before we start making excuses about the reasons why we can boast, let's always remember there needs to be a purpose to tell people about who we really are. There needs to be a reason. And that reason being someone is not being truthful about who we really are. And it can harm our name. But more importantly, especially in Paul's case, it can harm the name of Christ. So this point here, how to boast a little. How did Paul boast a little? And the applications I want to make for this is any situation when we're in, when someone is speaking evil of us. And we know that the things that they are saying are not true. We are innocent in this matter. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? Well, we deal with this the same way Paul dealt with this. We boast a little. Be open to discussion. Paul constantly asked these men and women to be open to talking to him and to have their hearts opened to him. 2 Corinthians 6. 6, verse 11. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children, you also be open. Look over in chapter 7, just verse 2. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have cheated no one. Paul's saying this whole group that comes to me with you, the group that you don't like now, we've been nothing but open to you. We're trying to talk to you. In the letter that I wrote before this, y'all basically ripped it up and gave it back. We're the ones trying to communicate with you. And for some reason, you're not being open to us. If there's any uh, situation or a scenario when someone is speaking evil about another, both parties have to be open and have an open heart. And whether that needs to be dealt with publicly or privately, it all depends on the situation. If someone's speaking evil about you, you don't need to write them off, be angry about it, and never willing to talk to them about what they've said. Never. That's not the way that Paul wants us to handle this. That's not the way that he handled it. He was always open to talk about it. These are the things that were said. These are the things that I feel about the things that were said, and this is the truth of the matter. Nothing will ever be solved if nobody talks about it. And you just let it burn inside you. And it turns into anger, and it turns into wrath, and then it turns into sin. And that is not the way that we handle these situations. We have open hearts towards each other. After they finally did open their hearts, and they did, I guess, accept 2 Corinthians as a letter, they did accept Timothy as he came and visited with them, he was absolutely truthful about who he was. He didn't hold anything back. 2 Corinthians 11 is where Paul famously talks about all the things that's happened to him in his life. How many times he was beaten, how many times he was shipwrecked. Uh, Let's just read a taste of this here. Verse 24 of chapter 11 From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often. And cold and nakedness. Besides these other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. And all these bad things that happened to Paul. Now, we read this from our perspective, or I know personally through my perspective, we don't see this as a bad thing of the things that he's saying. In my perspective, this is cool. 
Paul's able to say, look at all these things that I've done. I've been beaten, I've been stoned. And we see the glory in that. Maybe that's because uh, a lot of us are more experienced Christians and we know that he was doing these things, these things happened to him because of the cause of Christ. And we, in this, on a more materialistic way, in a worldly way, we see this as we just like scars, don't we? Uh, when I get together with the guys, you know, we start showing each other our scars, right? And we're almost proud of them. And there's always two stories, the story I, I want to tell you and the story that actually happened with these scars. I got this one on my face because I wanted to show my mother that there was chicken noodle cartoon characters in my soup. And so I fell and slid on the uh, fireplace mantle and I had to get stitches. And this one I got burned because I was baking cookies. Uh, that's embarrassing as well. But all these scars we glorify. We love to show each other our scars and all these things that we've done. But in this situation, and in Paul's world, scars were not something to be proud of. They didn't treat scars like the way we treat scars. And also, these scars that Paul had weren't ones that we have to roll up our sleeves for, little bitty things where we've gotten burned. These were just gashes all over his body. To the point that people called him weak. He just looks weak. He looks like he's just struggling in life. This is not something that Paul was proud of in a worldly sense of view. He wasn't happy he had all these scars all over his body. And the fact of the matter is he couldn't ever get on a ship without it wrecking. But he talks about negative things about himself, and it's because he is absolutely truthful. You don't believe I'm an apostle, so let me tell you about all the things I've done, because in fact, the truth is, I am an apostle. I'll even tell you the bad things. And this is the list of the bad things that it took out of Paul to be an apostle. So he was absolutely truthful. In chapter 12, chapter 12, I think, for me, is one of the most confusing chapters in the entire Bible because I don't understand what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the way the Holy Spirit gives him and others revelations, the way that God speaks to them. And what I basically believe is being that we don't really understand this passage is the point is we're not supposed to understand it. I believe what Paul's saying here in chapter 12 is I could wow you. I could tell you all these great things that about it is to be an apostle that would just impress you, but there would be nothing to gain by. If we look, verse 5, after he explains the way uh, these revelations are given, Of such a one I will boast, this is in chapter 12, verse 5, of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think above me what he sees in me to be, or hears from me. Verse 7, basically explaining he doesn't want to be exalted beyond measure. Verse 6, these key words here, that very first phrase, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. He is absolutely truthful. I am Paul. These are the truth about all the great things that I've seen, all the great things I know. This is the truth about all the bad things I've seen and all the bad things I know. This is the truth of who I am. And he was open about it. He had his heart open. He wanted them to know the truth. If you want to battle gossip, if you want to battle people that speak evil about you, number one and foremost, be truthful. Be the honest person you can be because honesty destroys gossip. And that's what helped Paul in this situation. He was absolutely honest. He was absolutely truthful. And this is so important as well because this is what Paul does before he even starts boasting about himself. He forgives those that spoke evil about him. In chapter 2, as far as we can do is read in between the lines and try to guess the story of what's going on. I believe that Paul is addressing an individual or a group of individuals that kind of started uh, this terrible calling of what Paul really was. And what he's doing is he's addressing this person that has, in fact, repented of this. That he did all these things, he said all these things about Paul, but now he's repented. And what he's saying is, is I'm going to forgive him. I already have forgiven him. Look here in verse 5 of chapter 2. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment which is inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive 
and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one to be swallowed up in too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For this end, I also wrote that I might put an end, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient to all things. Now, when you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I've forgotten anything, I've forgiven that one of your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul's attitude here is, this man's repented, he's trying to get right, I've already forgiven him. You should forgive him too. It's all over now. We can move on. In this, I believe this verse right here, people not obeying what Paul is telling us to do is why churches break up. This is why, not just break up, sometimes churches are just destroyed. Because mean things are said. Gossip has started. And then even after we may do these first two things, we can talk about it, we can be truthful with each other. The biggest problem is, is we can't forgive one another. Yet whoever this person is or this group is that said all these things about Paul, Paul's already forgiven him. He's already forgiven him. I encourage you to look at verse 11. We are told to forgive one another for this reason, for lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The problem is when we can't forgive each other, that's when Satan comes into play. This is one of his devices. As he tries to get people to turn against one another, brother against brother, sister against sister, and basically just internally destroy yourself while he just gets to watch not really have to lift uh, a finger, does he? He doesn't have to put any effort into it. We do it to ourselves. Yet Paul has already warned us. Paul knew about Satan's devices, and now we too are not ignorant of his devices. If someone tries to take away your good name, whatever it is, be open, be truthful, and then quickly, quickly forgive them all after it's all over. And what's so great about all these things is these are the things that we've been taught by Jesus. Jesus has given us the ability and the opportunity to forgive one another. And it's something that we should be so grateful of. And I know that we all are. I appreciate the close attention as always. Uh, as I was developing this sermon, uh, getting it together, thinking about a good name, uh, you'd always be surprised on the way I get my ideas for what I'm going to preach on. And I usually don't tell people because it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but all through this studying this, uh, this was inspired by a Jim Croce song. Uh, basically just talking about his good name. The song's called I've Got a Name. And basically what his song is is that because he has this name, because he's developed his name, he's able to do in life all these things that he wants to do. And I've talked about it that your name is a good thing. But... We have a name too, don't we? We get to carry the name of Jesus Christ. And that is a good name to have. And that is a name that is worth singing about. What that name does is that name gets us through this life. And that name just does not just get us through this life, but it gets us into the next. If you do not have the name of Christ yet, if you do not carry that name, you need to do something tonight, don't you? You need to do something because this life and especially the next will be miserable and will be terrible without his name, without his good name. If you've fallen away and you need to repent and you need to receive that name again, the forgiveness, and there's any way that we can help you in that, pray for you in that, and we also would like for you to take this opportunity to have that good name once again if you will come.